Hey everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, I'm taking a look at Plains Indian Wars, designed by John Paniski, with a solitaire system developed by Etienne Michaud and published by GMT. Plains Indian Wars covers the Great Plains skirmishes and battles that occurred in the latter half of the 19th century between the U.S. government, settlers, and the native Indian tribes in the area. It is a card-driven cube game that utilizes area control and movement. If you've played the Birth of America series of games, such as 1775 Rebellion from Academy Games, you will be familiar with the system. It can be played between one and four players, either four players, where each takes control of one of the major factions, two on each side, um, two-player game, where each side takes control of two major factions, so one side will take, care, take control of U.S. Cavalry and Settlers, the other would be the Northern Plains Tribes and the Southern Plains Tribes. Or there's a solitaire system where you can either play as the U.S. against the Native Indians, or you can play as the Native Indians against the U.S. forces. Let's go ahead and do a quick overview. I do have a full solitaire playthrough. Um, I'm not calling a tutorial just because of issues with the rulebook, which I'll go into a little bit in my cons. And then also you saw in that video, or we'll see if you watch it. Um, so you can, you can watch that though for a more in-depth look at the game. I play a complete game. Um, but in this video, we have that. also have a recon unboxing video. Um, but, after, but for today, we're going to do my uh, pros and cons, and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, so a quick overview. You can see I have the game set up here. This is the initial um, two-player setup. Um, I have the card decks and everything kind of on here with the dice um, with each of their factions. So looking at the map in the play area, you have Canada in the north, Mexico down here, and you can see different... Um, Different hotspots, different landmarks, Kansas City, Salt Lake City over here, the Rockies, um, Arizona's down here, Phoenix, etc., Dallas, Texas. So give you an idea of kind of what area this game encompasses and the actual play area encompasses. Within it, it's divided into these different regions, these different areas. Now, you also can see some colors, right? So the colors, and there's a lot of different colored cubes, colored areas. Looks a little complicated at first, at least it did to me. Um, once you're playing it, it's really quick, really easy, and it's not a problem at all. So let me kind of break it down for you. Like I mentioned before, you know, there is a way to four-player game, right? And you can see there's four different decks of cards, and that would be kind of the core of the four-player game. I feel that the majority of the time though this game is going to be played, it's probably going to be played either two-player or solitaire. In two-player and in solitaire, you basically have two different groups, and they're split. The right side of the board here, the left side, right? So you have these green, which are the Northern Plains Tribes Indians. You have orange, the Southern Plains Tribes. And then you have the U.S. Cavalry Settlers, you know, primarily, right, U.S. citizens that are primarily pushing westward, um, crossing the Great Plains, claiming land, moving towards the West Coast, etc. Along with the purple cubes, which represent it's called, you know, Plains Enemies, Southern Plains Enemies, Northern Plains Enemies. Basically, those were the Indian native tribes that were allied with the U.S. that primarily fought with the core of the Northern Plains and Southern Plains tribes. Um, and then as well, you also can see some white cubes, and there's black cubes I have off the board. The white cubes are wagons, representing wagons, wagon trains that are slowly following the trails. Santa Fe Trail, Mormon Trail. Oregon Trail, etc., following them, you know, heading out west. And then you have the black cubes, which those are not a faction per se. Those are just, you can see there's boxes here for the railroad. So the Transcontinental Railroad, Union Pacific, Central Pacific. During the game, the U.S. player is going to be building up the railroad, meeting from both sides, meeting somewhere in the middle, um, and trying to establish that railroad for victory point purposes. Also helps with movement. I talked about the the decks, the cubes, or at least I mentioned the decks. Let's talk about the cubes, right? Them moving around. They represent the forces. They start off in your holding boxes. You're going to deploy them. Each side has different rules, right? The natives are going to generally be able to deploy them easier wherever they want. Um, when it comes to the U.S. side, you going to have to deploy from either St. Louis or Sacramento. And the railroad has to be completed through the mountains first before you can deploy from Sacramento. When you get to the decks, so you have, you know, how do you get your cubes out there? Well, you have decks, and the decks are primarily made up of engagement cards and event cards. Now... The engagement cards are going to tell you something, and both sides' decks are relatively the same in that context, other than the pictures, you know, the names of them, the historical context, but for the actual gameplay aspect, they're going to be very similar. So what it'll be is, an, uh, you know, in a random event, it'll be 
something random, something event you can do. Usually, you know, it helps you, right? It's going to help you out, help you in during the combat, which are called engagements. Or when you have your engagement cards themselves, and they're called different term, not event, they're called War Party for the Native Indians. What you're doing is it'll have three boxes here. It'll tell you how many cubes you can add. And again, depending on who you are, depends on where you can add them. You'll be able to activate three groups, which is basically activating a region, you know, a group of cubes. And you'll be able to move them. So maybe three different regions you could activate, you know, up to. Um, you can move each one up to two regions. And then there's going to be some historical text on the bottom. So you're activating cubes, you're getting them on the board, you're moving them around, you're taking control of regions and areas. You know, eventually you're getting to the point where you have settlers that are along the railroad when you draw a disc, and I'll explain that in one second. Um, when you draw the discs, and I'll run that through the sequence of play, you're going to get to go ahead and maybe maybe build the railroad, maybe not. It just depends if you have settlers there. So talking about the each of the factions, and you saw the dice, right? They have their own dice. Very simple. When you get in engagements, when you have, which is the combat, you have, you know, opposing factions and occupying an area, they're going to fight each other. There's also some special rules for building the railroad, you're rolling settler dice, trying to get any icons, etc. It's all part of the game. I'm not going to explain everything here. You go ahead and watch my playthrough for that. But basically, you have blank sides, which can use you can use to retreat when you roll. You have these broken arrows, which are treaty sides. Um, if both sides happen to roll a broken arrow... Um, while they're in conflict with each other, generally speaking, the combat or engagement is going to end. And one side, usually the inferior side, you know, fewer numbers, they're going to have to retreat. And then you have a hit side, which, very simply put, you roll a hit. Odds are you're going to be eliminating an enemy cube. Goal, generally, is to eliminate the enemy cubes in an area, so you take control of it. Now, I mentioned the discs, right? The core of the game, or the core of the engine that drives it, is the disc draw. This is a random thing where every turn, and you can see the disc draw track down here in the bottom right of the video, one through seven, you're just simply going to pull them from a bag. I usually use a cup, but the bag is what comes with the game. And you're going to draw, and you're never going to know, okay, the green or Northern Plains Tribes disc is drawn. Now, again, depending on whether it is the single player or the solitaire game, basically, the Northern Plains Tribes can be their turn. Solitaire game, they do not use the deck if they're the enemy. Vice versa, right? If he plays them, then the U.S. Cav and the Settlers aren't going to use the deck. But in the two-player or four-player game, they have their deck of cards. They're gonna, you're going to draw three, and then you're going to decide what you want to do. You can play up to two events, and then you can also play one war party, which, remember, you're adding your cubes, activating groups, moving them around, engaging in combat or engagements, and trying to control different areas. You can continue that, drawing all the discs, going back and forth, you know, every turn, once you draw the end, unless the game ends, you're going to replenish it. Game traditionally is going to end when either the railroad is built or when one side runs out of their deck of cards and has gone through all of them, then the game will end and you will add up victory points. U.S. side, you know, you want to build that railroad, you want to take control of areas. There's also uh, special VP areas for the solitaire game. I don't have them marked, but it's things like the Black Hills, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, and maybe Denver. Um, I put like a red cube there just to show that. Then Indian native player, same thing, right? They're trying to control different areas. They're also trying to eliminate your wagons. Um, when you draw the certain cubes, you may not have a deck of cards. For instance, you see these white cubes. How do they get out there? These are your wagons, wagon trains. They'll start from St. Louis, and they follow the trail, right? Talked about the Oregon Trail, Santa Fe Trail. They slowly, turn by turn, follow the trail, and they're moving down, and they're trying to get right to the Rockies and past. While they're out here, they can be attacked by the Indian tribes, which they get to go ahead and place them on their victory points if they are able to destroy them. Otherwise, if they make it all the way through, you're going to add them to your victory point track or the U.S. control uh, player's victory point track. So... All right, I think this overview went a little longer than I thought it would, but I just want to do, you know, I want you guys to understand the game. Because, again, it's not complicated, but I feel like for you to really get an idea of what I'm talking about during my review, which is coming up very shortly, I want you to understand how the game works, right? Drawing a disc, activating that faction. They are going to be playing cards. Those cards are going to activate their cubes, place them, then move them, do engagements, combat, next disc, so next faction, etc., etc. Until you run through your deck of cards, and it's primarily, like I said, the two to four player game. Or in the single player, it's a little bit more random. The 
Indian tribes, if they're the enemy, or US, if they're the enemy, are going to be placed more randomly and stuff. Again, there's a completely different game. I played the Solitaire variant in my playthrough. So I think it's enough for an overview. Let's go to my pros and cons, and of course, wrap up with my final thoughts. All right, pros and cons. Cons first, as always. If you've heard anything about this game already, one of the things you've probably heard from people is that the rulebook is a mess. Unfortunately, they are right. This rulebook, and I'm talking about both the regular rulebook and the solitaire rulebook, frankly, they're disasters. You know, there's different terms used to describe the same thing. There's missing phrases and sentences, missing terms. There's a, there are even entire sequences and procedures missing from the books. For example, how is control for the U.S. player not described anywhere in the book? How can an entire process in the solitaire system not be introduced properly so you don't even know how to use it? The actual process is listed, but how to introduce it, how to, how to actually conduct it and, and squeeze it into the sequence of play isn't even in the book. You know, it feels like the only people who looked at the rule books before approving them were people who had already, you know, they already knew how to play the game. So they didn't even realize that there was key information missing. Information you need to know to know how to play the game. It's just very unfortunate, and it's a mark against GMT for publishing the game in this state. Second, you know, just to be clear, it's not a historical simulation. That should be clear, but I want to emphasize. You know, the way the system works, you'll often, often see different Native Indian groups teaming up together. Um, you know, you'll see these really large battles over and over. Just all those things were uncommon in real life. You know, it's, it's ahistorical. The tribes, they fought against each other just as often as they fought against the United States forces, against cavalry and settlers. They did that before the settlers even showed up on scene, um, before U.S. was even the United States, right? Before colonists arrived from Europe, there were certain groups of Indians that were fighting each other. And it continued during and after, right? It didn't stop. So having them work together as much as they do, and I understand now the purple represents the ones that are allied with the U.S., but when you have the sort of monolithic green, monolithic orange, you know, it's a little, again, it's a little ahistorical. But, you know, simula simulating that complex web of diplomacy, you know, temporary allegiances, back and forth, you know, one second they're working with, you know, U.S. cavalry and U.S. forces, the next they're, they're um, um, ambushing them, you know, it's just outside of the scope of this game. Keep in mind, it's a relatively simple game. You know, it's a card-driven cube pusher at its core. Now, referring back, and onto my pros now, referring back to these poor rule books, thankfully, John Paniski and Etienne Michaud are both very active on Board Game Geek and have been answering people's questions. You know, they've both said they're working on an updated living rule book. I'm really hopeful that it's for both the multiplayer and the solitaire game. So, you know, kudos and thank you to them for addressing the problems, you know, not just leaving the game, leaving people hanging, leaving the game, you know, it gets released and then it just dies, right? DOA, dead on arrival. I'm really thankful that they're addressing the problems. You know, they're making sure that those who want to put in the extra effort are able to learn and play the game as it was intended. You know, I went through a lot of forums, a lot of threads, reading, you know, writing in notes, taking, you know, getting updated kind of player aids from people just to make sure I was playing the game as intended. Still probably not 100%, honestly, but at least closer to what the vision was as opposed to what you can learn straight out of the box from the rulebook. Second thing I want to address is the components. They're they're fantastic. You know, the map's mounted. The artwork is beautiful, right? The beautiful on the map. It's just beautiful. It's so easy to see everything. Very simple, yet just very striking, catches the eye. And speaking of the beautiful art and design, I simply, I love the cards. I mentioned this during my unboxing. I couldn't shut up about them enough. It's just fantastic, you know, seeing, you know, historical photographs or artwork, you know, and then in the background, seeing sort of the forts, seeing information, very clear titles, very clear of the actions are taken, right? The gameplay aspect of it, but then ending them with, you know, a, a solid paragraph usually, or a couple sentences of the historical information, that, that living history, the information that we want to have, right? As we're learning, as we're learning, we're playing. We either may know it already, but if we don't, it's that much more valuable, valuable to us to have that, you know, have that information there. Now, I don't know if they needed to be the tarot size, right? The like big size instead of just like the regular standard poker sized, 
But regardless, you know, that does give them more room, you know, for not only the information for the gameplay, but all that other stuff. So speaking of history, um, one of the game's strong suits, I think, is history overall. You don't know, as I mentioned in the cons, it's not a historical simulation. But I don't expect that going in, and neither should you. The game you're getting puts the history on display for you. You know, you have settlers slowly marching westward, sometimes supported by U.S. cavalry, sometimes kind of on their own. And as they're advancing, the railroad is being built, railroad, let me pronounce that correctly, railroad, is being built section by section, right, following the path here. You know, meanwhile, the native Indian tribes, you know, they're getting squeezed on every side, whether it's by enemy Indian tribes, by U.S., by, you know, U.S. cavalry, by settlers, they're going to have to fight back any way they can, whether that's destroying wagons that are left alone, ambushing settlers, or, yeah, even engaging in, you know, larger battles with U.S. forces and their Indian allies. Finally, the distraw system. It adds a really nice level of uncertainty and fog of war. You never know which facking faction will be taking their actions next from turn to turn. You know, oh, hey, it's the settlers this time. Well, maybe next game, instead of the settlers going second, they're going to go last. U.S. Cavalry will get to go before them. You know, you just never know. Not only that, some of the event cards, they can only be played before or after a certain faction has acted. You know, it might say, play this after U.S. Cavalry. Or it might say, play this before. Play this before Northern Plain Tribes. Well, if the Northern Plain Tribes have already acted that turn, that means you can't even use that event card. But I like that, right? I like that it, it just not just you draw an event. Okay, yep, this is a great event. I always play it as soon as I draw it. You may not be able to based on what's going on with the disc draw, based on who has acted already. It's a nice touch overall. And it even makes the full two-player game, you know, outside of this entire solitaire system, very solitaire friendly. I've played both the two-player game and I've played the solo system and both work equally well. All right, my final thoughts. Plains Indian Wars is a good game at its core, bringing attention to an undergame topic, but it is marred by a poor rulebook. If the idea of a game that comes out of the box, not ready to go, turns you off, this one won't be for you. You'll likely think it requires too much work to make sense of everything and to make sure you're actually playing the game as intended. You're going to have to go online. You're going to have to read. You're, if you don't have your own questions answered, you're going to be reading literally dozens of threads where people have sometimes dozens of questions within the thread that the designers are answering. Now, if you don't mind wading through those threads on BoardGameGeek to find those clarifications or, you know, even entire missing sections of the rulebook, you know, being posted by both the designer and the developer, you'll be able to put together a satisfying, educational, and simply put, fun gaming experience. You're going to be playing cards, you know, pushing cubes around, rolling dice, Always hoping you get that much needed hit. All right, so for further reading on the topic here, so I know that this is something that, like I said, I feel it's undergamed, and I don't want to say understudied, but certainly, right, it's something that is not incredibly common. It's so talking Battle of the Bulge here. So, what I like to do is recommend a book. In my case here, I really have enjoyed The Earth is Weeping by Peter Cousins. Simply put, he described the true brutality of this entire conflict and the heartbreak, both caused and suffered by both sides. Or I should say every side, because there really wasn't just two sides. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. You know, Let me know in the comments below what you think of my video and what you think of this game. Have you played it yet? Are you going to pick it up? You know, What are your thoughts on, on the situation, the state of the game that's been released? And are you hopeful going forward with the game? And until next time, everyone, later.